Kia ora koutou. Welcome to the Skylight Trust webinar on working with trauma. My name's Dr Chris Bowden from Victoria University Wellington and I'm going to be talking to you today about how we work with people who have experienced trauma. Just to give you a bit of background and context, the reason that I'm interested in this area of research and practice is because I work uh, with people who've experienced traumatic grief after suicide. And that's a form of traumatic grief that affects people in many different ways. Today we're going to be looking at how uh, clinicians and people working directly with trauma, uh, what is their approach, what are some of the principles and guidelines that uh, shape their practice, and how can they help people work through trauma towards recovery. As you see on this infographic, we've got two pictures, trauma-specific treatment and trauma-informed service delivery. Now I see these on a continuum. So we have services that provide support and education and other access to important resources for people who have experienced trauma. But we also at times need to refer people to uh, trauma-specific treatment providers. Those tend to be clinical or mental health professionals who have a counselling or therapeutic background, but may also include people like GPs, uh, clinical social workers, therapists and others. We're going to talk mostly today about trauma-specific treatment and what does that entail? Uh, what are some of the key characteristics of that and how might it help people who have experienced trauma? Before I talk a, a bit about the work that therapists and counsellors do in working with trauma, I want to uh, mention the fact that we have first responders who are often uh, those first people point of call uh, who have a contact, first initial contact with people who have experienced trauma. Uh, these first responders typically have uh, training and supervision around being able to provide uh, survivors of trauma with psychological first aid. They may also be involved in critical incident stress debriefing, and this is something that first responders often receive after working with people who have experienced trauma. Both of these are important because they set the scene to stabilise somebody so that the others who come in to provide support later on can work effectively with that individual or group. The critical incident stress debriefing is also important in order to keep our first responders safe and um, uh, promote their well-being. Now, there are many guidelines for practice that are available on the internet and that have been written in terms of government reports. Mental health professionals who work in this area of trauma come from a variety of backgrounds and so there's no set uh, single guideline for all professionals to follow. More importantly, there's a more of a framework for practice, a set of principles that can be adapted by professionals to ensure that they're working in a safe and effective way. You can see here from this list, the people that work directly with individuals with lived experience of trauma include clin psychs, counsellors, GPs, occupational therapists and so forth. All of these people and professionals will work in different ways with trauma. Trauma is complex. There are many different kinds of trauma. There's trauma that initially presents in some ways and may uh, present in other ways later on. We have delayed trauma. And our understanding of trauma is continually developing. As we do more research and we understand the effects that trauma has on people, we also uh, start to understand pathways to recovery and what it is that people need in terms of support. What constitutes effective support, uh, what is helpful, what is unhelpful, what works for some groups and not for other groups. And so our research base and knowledge base around this area is continually evolving. What I'm going to talk about now is some basic foundational principles for effective treatment and support provision. So this is based on what we currently know is effective and safe and what we have best evidence for. So, as I said before, these are some guidelines that we can follow 
and in particular that clinicians or uh, those providing that direct treatment can follow. The first one, and probably the most important of all of these principles, is safety. We cannot do any work with clients around trauma until a safe environment has been established and a safe relationship. We can't dig into that trauma, we can't help that person express uh, or uh, talk about that trauma or process that trauma until we've established safety. So the second step in, in treating trauma is to help people develop the ability to self-regulate and in particular regulate the emotions that they may be experiencing in relation to trauma. So part of that establishing safety is helping people develop tools to self-soothe, to calm themselves, to ground themselves so that their trauma does not become overwhelming. This is the groundwork for therapy. The third principle or guideline for practice should be that we need to understand that people are affected in multiple domains by that trauma and that we actually need to help people restore functioning in multiple areas of their life. So it could be emotional, it could be physical, it could be social, cognitive or spiritual and in actual fact trauma probably affects multiple areas all at the same time. So talking therapies or top-down therapies which are cognitive therapies are not going to address all of those domains. We may need to do body work and other forms of work with people who are experiencing trauma. The fourth guideline is that we need to understand and communicate to clients that we understand that their symptoms of trauma, the way that they adapt to their trauma, is a normal reaction to an abnormal event that they have experienced. So their drinking, their mental health issues, their behavioural problems are not symptoms of an illness, but are rather their ways of trying to cope with what has happened. And that this trauma has disempowered them um, in ways that um, hinders their ability to cope in healthy ways. The fifth guideline is that we need to understand and communicate to clients how trauma affects the brain. A lot of people do not understand how trauma affects them cognitively, psychologically and emotionally and that we need to help them understand what's going on inside and what's going on in terms of their internal experiences. I'm going to come back to this later on because some of the key aspects of treatment are dealing with things like self-blame, guilt, anger and an inability to regulate emotions. The sixth guideline is encouraging the establishment and strengthening healthy, healthy relational support. In order to do effective trauma work, people need support outside of the therapeutic relationship. They need support of friends and family and people around them who understand what it is that they're going through and their journey to recovery. The seventh guideline is that we need to be attuned and sensitive to attachment issues. People who have experienced trauma have often been betrayed in terms of their intimate relationships with people that they've trusted. And so clinicians need to understand that clients may have difficulties trusting even health professionals to provide guidance and support and not to reject them. And so we need to work very carefully to form uh, positive, healthy attachments and to communicate to clients that this relationship is the tool for the therapy. The eighth guideline is that we need to understand and respond to disassociative states. People who have experienced trauma can go into hyperarousal or hypoarousal and this can make it very difficult to work with them. They may be unable to focus on information that we're providing, unable to process what's happening, and that we need to keep clients within a window of tolerance where they're open to uh, understanding their experience. The ninth guideline is that we need to work with clients in relation to a range of responses. Trauma triggers a number of responses. People can feel anger, 
guilt, shame, fear, and we need to be able to work with each of those and understand them as normal responses to an abnormal event. We also need to embed and apply an understanding of trauma and complex trauma in all our interventions. So this means that whatever we do must be grounded in sound theory, research and evidence, as well as clinical insights. We need to ensure that our therapeutic approach promotes integration and functioning. That means working on memory, attention, cognition, as well as bodily and other sensory motor uh, processing. We also need to recognise that the traditional therapeutic approaches of working with people who are experiencing mental health and addiction issues may not work for uh, for people who are, have experienced trauma, and they may need to be adapted to that specific group. We need a range of bottom-up, sensory motor type therapeutic interventions, as well as top-down approaches that focus on thinking and emotions. The 13th guideline is that all treatment needs to be phased, and that means establishing safety, moving on to processing the trauma, and then finally integrating that trauma within a coherent narrative for clients. That is the general and accepted uh, three stages of therapy and counselling. The 14th principle or guideline says that we need to tailor our therapy and interventions because one size does not fit all. This means that as clinicians and practitioners, we need to make sure that our, uh, our work is culturally uh, responsive, gender responsive and age appropriate and takes into account the differences that people have and bring to their therapeutic work. Fifteenth principle reflects that as well in terms of being sensitive to the differences between clients and the sixteenth principle says we need to engage in regular professional supervision and this is in order to ensure safety for clinicians doing this work. The final guidelines focus on the pacing and uh, the length of time that treatment goes for. Trauma work tends to go for a lot longer than other therapeutic work because a lot of effort needs to be put into that stabilisation and safety in the initial contacts. We also need to work hard to maintain professional boundaries with clients because people who have experienced trauma will have difficulties maintaining safe distance, closeness, and also attachment. We need to engage in collaborative care, and that means involving Fano where appropriate in relation to helping clients develop care plans and recovery plans, but also working collaboratively with professionals over multiple areas and providers. Finally, we need to um, focus on continuity of care, because when our treatment and work with a client comes to an end, we need to ensure that that client is transitioned to other forms of support that are appropriate and that process is um, uh, conducted in a way uh, that provides safety and um, prevents abandonment and further rejection. The final principle is that we need to understand that our clients are diverse, that trauma is diverse and therefore recovery is diverse and that there is no single pathway towards recovery. People will find their own ways towards recovery and healing and growth with the help of their therapist and practitioner. I want to move on now and look at what are some of the core competencies that we, we need uh, our professionals to have in relation to working with trauma. And you can see here from the list, trauma awareness is one of these main competencies. And under that comes an understanding of both trauma-informed and trauma-specific care and services. It means counsellors and others need to understand the effects of trauma and abuse, both short-term and long-term, on human development and on relationships. And that professionals need to understand that how people express trauma will also differ across people, that the protective factors uh, are just as important as the risk factors in helping people in their journey to recovery, and that client safety is, needs to be paramount. Uh, we need to protect our clients from being re-traumatised and from doing work which may re-trigger them. In terms of counselling skills or therapeutic skills, you can see here from this list 
that there are some key issues around sharing power, working together collaboratively, maintaining clear roles and boundaries, having some competency around screening and assessment for trauma, being able to help people identify their strengths, their coping resources and their resiliency in order to help them move towards that journey of recovery, teaching some skills, and this is something that I'm particularly interested in coming from an education background. There are aspects of counselling and therapy that have an educational component. And a lot of this work in trauma is about teaching clients what they can do for themselves to retain and uh, regain control, um, but also around helping them um, work through periods of stress and distress and learning new strategies for self-care. I want to move on now and just briefly touch on uh, some of the trauma-specific interventions. So these are programs or interventions that trauma specialists and therapists might apply or use with their clients. And you can see here, I'm not going to mention them all, there's a range here from cognitive behavioural therapy to trauma-focused CBT, CBTI for sleep issues. We know that people who've experienced trauma often have flashbacks and nightmares and that their sleep is really hindered in their process of recovery. And so some of these interventions work on the thinking, some of them work on emotions, some of them work on sleeping, uh, some of them work on helping uh, uh, clients develop uh, a, a coherent narrative, the narrative approaches. Some of them focus on skills training. Some of them focus on uh, mental health and recovery. Um, and some of these interventions work particularly well for men or women or around particular issues around PTSD and domestic violence and abuse. So it pays to do your homework and it pays to uh, do some research around what uh, interventions are available, which ones have the best evidence, and what might work with our clients, and being able to adapt these and use these in a systematic way. I also wanted to mention the fact that we've moved on from the days of everybody having to see therapists on a regular basis to um, also engaging with clients in relation to mental health apps. And we see these now as uh, important tools in people's kits for um, managing the symptoms of trauma at home. And you can see here from this list, there are coaching apps for both people who've experienced trauma, but also for friends and family who might be supporting people who've experienced trauma. So we've got PTSD coaches for families, for family members, so that they can understand what their partner or mum or dad or relative is experiencing in relation to PTSD and what it is that they can do to help and support that person. So this is something that might be uh, useful to explore with clients and is certainly something that we need to uh, keep our, um, our mind on in relation to uh, future developments in the technology. I want to move on now and talk a little bit about well, what actually happens in the work that we do with clients around trauma. Um, and as I said, we have these three stages of trauma therapy. The first stage is around establishing safety and control. And that may include providing some psychoeducation, some information, some skill building with clients in order to make sure that they are in a safe space to be able to start talking about and working through their trauma. The second stage involves processing the trauma narrative. There are many techniques that are used in relation to that. If we think about children and young people, that can be done through metaphor, through artwork, through storytelling. For older people, it can be done through narrative and talking therapy. But a lot of this work is focused on challenging um, unhelpful and unhealthy beliefs, um, emotions, and also restoring a sense of reality to people who've experienced trauma, helping them understand that what has happened to them has changed them and distorted their view of reality in people. The third stage is integration and reconnection to self. And in this stage, therapists and others are working with clients in order to help them move back into their community and society in terms of coming out of survival mode and going, what do I want my future to look like? What do I want to, uh, to do? What are my goals in life? How can I reclaim uh, my life and make some positive choices going forward. 
So you can see here there are three key stages, the establishing safety, the working through the narrative, and then becoming a more future oriented focus in the integration phase. And this is fairly typical across most people who work in this area. Let's have a look at some of the therapeutic goals. So this is what we talk about in relation to um, what do we want to achieve? What do we want to have happen for our clients? The first one you can see again, safety and stabilization and creating a secure base. But then you can see as we move down those goals, there is a more of a focus on helping people restore their functioning. And also the validation and normalization of what they're experiencing. Then we move into processing those experiences, restoring uh, reality, and on the far side here, you can see here, what we're doing is helping that person grieve, um, understand that they do not have to hang on to parts of their experience that they don't want to hang on to, um, to reconnect with the world, and to move forward in a new way. The post-traumatic growth is something I'm particularly interested in, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later in relation to um, what can we learn from this experience and how do people change in a positive way as a result of experiencing trauma. I think that's a really important message of hope to provide clients with. So how does therapy help? Why should someone who's experienced trauma go to therapy or seek help from a clinical professional? Well, therapy and counselling helps people to manage their symptoms. It teaches them how to keep control and maintain their well-being. It also helps them learn to live with and bear the memories and the experiences of that trauma, to understand that while those things have happened to them, they don't have to be the defining part of their life and that that is something that makes them who they are and doesn't mean that they are damaged goods. It also helps people develop a memory and a narrative that they can tell safely to others about their story and about what's happened to them. It helps them restore damaged self-esteem. It helps them re-establish important relationships in their life. And it helps them reconstruct or develop a coherent system of meaning around this is what happened to me and this is what it means to me and this is how I'm prepared to talk about this in my story going forward. So therapy is really helpful for people who are stuck, for people who are um, struggling to come up with skills and strategies for moving forward. I wanted to mention this idea here of the window of tolerance because this is really important. When working with people who have experienced trauma, they can move between um, being hyper-aroused and hypo-aroused and it's really difficult when working with people who've experienced trauma to keep them in this what we call a window of tolerance, which is a, a little window between those fluctuations of wanting to shut everything out and not wanting to think about anything and deal with anything, and um, overthinking and over-experiencing and over-feeling everything. And so keeping people in that window enables us to do that therapeutic work. If we're not aware of this and we're not keeping people within that threshold, doing any kind of therapeutic work or any kind of intervention is going to be really difficult. So how do uh, professionals help clients? What do they actually do that helps? This is what I want to talk about now. And you can see here the very first one is psychoeducation. This is really important and it's also something that Skylight Trust does really well. What we're trying to do in this is help people understand what trauma is and what it is that they're going through. And also, psychoeducation is about teaching people skills that they may not have had, and it's also about helping them understand how they can problem solve. The use of anchors and oases, this is really interesting. These are techniques that we can use to help uh, people who've experienced trauma ground themselves and keep calm in situations where they may be experiencing triggers or flashbacks or intrusive memories. In these moments of distress, we can teach people how to uh, focus on something in their environment or focus on their body that takes their, um, their 
focus away from the distress and puts it in some a place that helps them enable uh, them to be calm and to restore that um, sense of balance. So an oasis is kind of like a happy place that people can go to, um, that they can imagine, or it could be a real place that they have got a photograph of, that they carry around with them in their pocket, and that brings back good memories of, of a safe place and a happy time. And this is what helps them in these moments of distress. Anchors can also be objects, like a ponamu stone, a cross, a ring, something that helps them remember that people care about them, love them, um, and you know, are there with them in their journey to recovery. So it's really important to help clients identify what these anchors and oases might be and to promote their use in times of distress. We can also teach people how to manage stress. We can all do with this one, not just people who have experienced trauma, but teaching people about stress reduction and, and what it is that helps and doesn't help in relation to stress reduction. For example, why it's so important to get a good night's sleep why it's important to cut down on caffeine and stimulant use, why alcohol might exacerbate some of the experiences and uh, negative effects that they have. Um, so, you know, teaching them relaxation techniques, um, encouraging them to use yoga, aromatherapy and alternative medicines as a way of um, promoting stress reduction. Um, all of these techniques can be put into a kit that they can then use or select from because again, it's really important to enable clients to have control and choice. So our job is basically to teach some of those strategies and to open them up to um, exploring what their strategies might become. In terms of managing triggers and flashbacks, this is work that usually happens a little bit later on, but it enables people to identify what it is that actually triggers their trauma and re-triggers their trauma what it is that contributes to those flashbacks, and when they can identify what those situations and sights and smells and experiences might be, then they can learn to either avoid those or control those or put some things in place so that they don't get overwhelmed in those situations. So you can see why exploring some of these things might happen a little bit later on after we've done the safety. I wanted to touch on grounding techniques because I think these are really important for people. Grounding techniques can be all sorts of things in relation to helping people either focus on objects, smells, images, phrases. These are all things that can ground people in the present. Trauma has a way of taking people back to the past, trapping them in a memory which is very painful. And what we can do with grounding techniques is help bring people back to the present. When I stand here with my feet on the ground and I take a deep breath and I look around me and I notice some of the things that are around me in this room, I become grounded, I become centered, I become focused on what is happening right here and now and I become less focused on what happened yesterday or what happened last week or last month. All of these strategies can help people move from a trauma response to a, a, a safe space or an oasis and ground them, um, ground them in a way that takes their focus away from a painful memory and puts it in the present where they are calm. I particularly like the grounding phrases and what we, we call these mantras. Um, things that people can tell themselves when they feel distressed or in a situation where they're re-experiencing that trauma traumatic effect. I am okay. I am safe. I am strong. This is just a nightmare. This is just a flashback. I'm not reliving this. These are the mantras that we encourage people to tell themselves and to say out loud in order to ground them back in the present day and to remind them that they are safe and secure. We can use all sorts of activities in relation to grounding and calming and self-soothing. Um, I guess in terms of working with people in, with trauma, um, it's about finding what works for them. You know, which of these techniques and strategies might help them and getting them to do a little bit of homework in terms of trying some of these out and seeing how they feel as a result of that. Yoga, drumming, meditation, 
destimulation, actually removing people away from the media, from you know, uh, television, music, finding a quiet, safe space somewhere, that might work for some people, but not for others. How do we manage hyperarousal and hypoarousal? Well, when people are uh, hyperaroused, it's usually brought on by triggers that, that remind them of that trauma. And what we're trying to do there is to calm and self-soothe and to help clients turn the dial down. And this is something that I do with people, is I actually get them to imagine themselves turning an actual dial down. What needs to happen in order for them to turn that distress down, even a notch or a couple of notches? Or to think of it like a television remote. How do we turn the volume down on the television remote? And so there are lots of things that we can do to take people away from that distress and hyperactivity. We can distract them. We can get them to visualize something. We can get them to make a list of what they need to do today. There are all sorts of things that we can do, but most of these techniques focus on the five senses. Getting people to, um, to think about what they're smelling, what they're hearing, what they're seeing, um, and what they sense. And this is what takes them away from that memory. If we look at hypoarousal, this is very different. This is people who are shutting down and disassociating. So these are clients who are basically moving away from the thinking and the emotion with the trauma and going into their body. And they may experience numbness. They may experience a detachment from their body. So it's almost like they describe it as floating above themselves or leaving their body and for them, that is the only way for them to escape that trauma. What we need to do in this situation is help people bring back, bring their senses back to their body and to their mind. So in this, we could help them get warm. We could get them to wiggle their feet, uh, move around a little bit, become more aware of their body, but also engage in some mental stimulation, getting them to count back from 100. Um, these are things which distract them from the memory and take them away from that, but also encourage them to regain control of their senses. What else can we do in relation to helping clients? Well, there's lots of things in relation to trauma. I guess the negative thoughts and beliefs are something that therapists spend most of their time working with. As a result of trauma, people can come to uh, believe different things about themselves, about others, and about the world. And some of those beliefs are unhealthy and unhelpful and untrue, um, and we need to challenge them. So, for example, as a result of their trauma, people might come to believe that I deserved what happened to me. Um, I will never be happy again. They may believe that they have no future, that there is no recovery, um, that nobody can be trusted. And so we need to safely and carefully help clients challenge those beliefs and see that what they are based on is um, one experience that they've had. We need to help clients manage their memories. And memory work is something that's not done until the therapeutic relationship is well and truly established. In helping clients deal with their memories, it may be that people have no recall of what happened to them. They may have partial recall of what happened to them or full recall of what happened to them. So helping people work through those memories and articulate them and develop a story around them needs to be done very carefully. Shame, guilt and self-blame are also really common in people who've experienced abuse and trauma. Shame, and particularly chronic shame, is really damaging. When we blame ourselves, we usually blame ourselves for something that we've done you know, an action or a behavior. Um, but shame is really different. Shame is something that affects our whole being. It, it's, it's something that attacks our whole self. So when we are ashamed and shamed by others, um, that can be particularly damaging. We need to help clients develop and manage healthy boundaries. When they have experienced particularly physical abuse, sexual abuse, or intimate partner violence, People can have real difficulty trusting others, developing stable attachments, regulating closeness and distance. 
and we often see people who have experienced trauma grappling with issues like wanting to be close and to be comforted and cared for by others, but then pushing them away when they get too close because they fear getting hurt or rejected. So um, therapists and counsellors will be working with clients to help them um, repair their understanding of what healthy relationships look like, but also work around uh, collapsed and rigid boundaries. What kinds of boundaries need to be put in place and how can they communicate to others in a safe way what is it that they need from a relationship both physically, emotionally and sexually. We also need to help clients manage grief and loss. With trauma comes grief. When people have experienced traumatic events in their life, they have to often deal with the grief that comes with loss. The loss of innocence, the loss of relationships, the loss of well-being, the loss of self-esteem, of self-control, the loss of happiness. These are a lot of losses to deal with. We also see not just this cumulative loss and a cumulative loss, but also there are things that happen in relation to trauma that stop people from grieving in healthy ways. Obstacles and barriers to grief. And guilt and self-blame are two of those biggest barriers. I have no right to grieve and feel loss and experience sadness in a relation to this when I blame myself for what happened. So therapists and counsellors need to address those cognitions and beliefs before they can deal with the grief and loss. It's also doing grief work around trauma means helping people reclaim some of the things that they feel they have lost. So, for example, someone might feel like they have lost their childhood because they have had to grow up, they've had to grow up quickly, um, they feel that they missed out on the innocence and playfulness of being a child as a result of what's happened to them. Well, that doesn't mean that we can't help those people reclaim their childhood as an adult. They can learn to play, they can learn to be free, they can learn to um, have aspects of that childhood in their everyday current life. And that's very powerful for helping people move towards recovery. One of the last things we need to do in terms of helping clients is help clients understand that there will be setbacks in their journey towards recovery that they will take two steps forward and maybe three steps back someday. And what we need to do is make sure that every client has a plan. Every client practices these skills and strategies and that they know that there are going to be hard times down the road and that they know what to do when they experience those hard times. And that may mean coming back to therapy and coming back to counselling or back to professionals for more support but it's also about helping them find strategies that they can do uh, to keep themselves safe and well in the meantime and to maintain those supportive networks outside of the therapeutic relationship. The last thing I want to touch on um, before I talk a little bit about um, the impact of this work on uh, clinicians is the idea of post-traumatic growth. Post-traumatic growth is something which more and more researchers and clinicians are paying more attention to. We're seeing more evidence of it in different contexts. And it's a little bit different to resiliency. Resiliency comes from experiencing an adverse event or experience and then not developing psychopathology or problems as a result. So that individual or community or group deal with that adversity and continue to function in relation to being well, being happy and achieving things in life. Post-traumatic growth is a little bit different. Post-traumatic growth comes from experiencing the traumatic event itself. So this is something that comes out of that adversity. It's linked to the learning and the self-reflection that comes from trauma. I want to show you some examples of this. Trauma transforms people. And a lot of people talk about having a different identity, a different self. 
before, during and after trauma. I was a different person before the traumatic event. This is who I was. This is who I was as I experienced the trauma. And this is who I am now, post-trauma. And post-traumatic growth um, recognises that we can't go back and be who we were before the trauma. But we can look on and reflect on our experience of that trauma, learn from it, learn something about ourselves, and grow as a result of that learning. Do things differently. And this is what we see in terms of people who have recovered or are working their way through trauma in terms of that recovery process. Now we know that there are some different things that contribute to post-traumatic growth. The ability to reflect and accept what has happened. The ability of people to look on what has happened and see that they have developed some new strengths, some courage, maybe some new resources that they've got in their life. We know that finding meaning in what has happened helps people. We know that positive self-talk and optimism help people. And we know that people who use different kinds of coping experience post-traumatic growth. Those who go, you know what, I can't, I can't do anything about this. I have to accept what has happened, but I'm not going to let it control me going forward. People who use acceptance coping. People who reappraise the situation and go, well, what have I learned from this? I can look at it this way, I'm damaged goods, or I can look at it this way in terms of I sh I've shown courage and perseverance to get through what I've gone through. So these are the things we know contribute to post-traumatic growth. And these are some of the signs of post-traumatic growth that we need to look out for and remind our clients of. So when we see this in people, we need to point it out to them. For example, people will talk about um, how life has changed and in some ways their life has gotten better. Maybe they've developed a greater appreciation of life. Maybe they've figured out who their real friends and family are. Maybe they've identified some important priorities in their life, some key values in their life, and the little stuff doesn't matter anymore. They've identified things that are more important. Maybe they've identified a purpose in life that I need to be able to um, use this experience to help others. And Tadeshi and Calhoun created an inventory to actually measure post-traumatic growth so that we can actually see how far people have experienced this and how much growth they've experienced. And the interesting thing about the research in this area is that it seems that the more extreme the trauma, the more potential people have for post-traumatic growth. And this is what people talk about um, in relation to um, uh, some of the items that are measured in that inventory. Uh, people talk about um, having greater intimacy, more compassion for themselves and for other people. They talk about having new roles and relationships. They talk about having a sense of personal strength. They talk about a spiritual change, you know, um, understanding that there is something bigger in life than them and maybe a, a, a higher being who looks after them and helps them and having a deeper appreciation for what life is about. So these signs of post-traumatic growth are important to um, identify in our clients, but also to help our clients see and understand that they are changing and growing as a result of this experience. The last thing I want to touch on is the importance of positive experiences in relationships. When helping people through trauma, one of the most powerful tools that we have are positive relationships. Trauma changes the way the brain works. It changes neural pathways. It changes the way we think about the world. Those negative experiences change us. So it makes sense that positive experiences, positive events, positive relationships can also change our brain structure and change our view of the world and the way that we are in the world. And so in order to help people 
make sense and process and feel safe and journey towards recovery. These relationships are of utmost importance, these positive experiences. How do people who have experienced trauma come to learn to trust again? They do it through the therapeutic relationship. How do they learn that not everyone wants to hurt them? How do they learn that relationships can help meet their needs? They learn this through the relationship with the therapist and the counsellor. But beyond the counselling environment, people can promote recovery through positive relationships with survivors. In this last part of the webinar, I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges uh, that therapists and counsellors can encounter in working with people who have experienced trauma. And I also want to talk a little bit about burnout and secondary traumatic stress disorder um, in relation to the toll that this work can have on professionals. You can see here I've identified three key challenges. First is what I would call professional challenges. These are challenges that we encounter in relation to our training, our reflexive practice, our ability to use different approaches, to tolerate uncertainty, to not know what's going to happen for our clients, and to be able to manage things like secondary traumatic stress and vicarious traumatisation. So these are challenges that come with working within this professional field. There are also challenges that occur within the therapeutic process. There are some things that happen in relation to working with people who've experienced trauma that make that work difficult. Um, first of all, people who've experienced trauma have difficulties with power and control. So therapists and counsellors need to be extremely patient, extremely uh, empathetic towards people and share power and control, which is something that they might not be used to doing in a therapeutic environment. Um, there's going to be lots of testing and boundaries. Um, people who've experienced trauma, particularly interpersonal trauma, will try and push therapists and counsellors' buttons to see how far they can test that person's patience or uh, their respect. We can also get tested in relation to outbursts of anger, volatility of emotion, and also containment and attunement of emotions. You know, trying to figure out where our clients are at in terms of their emotional state. The pacing of the sessions, this is what comes in with the challenges of actually doing therapeutic work. Um, we need to work slowly. We need to work carefully. Uh, we need to manage beginnings and endings, not just of the work that we do overall, but every session needs to be carefully planned. People need time to prepare for the end of a session so that they're not feeling like they're being rejected and abandoned every time they come to therapy and counselling. We need to be able to handle things like silence in our work. Uh, we need to be able to manage our own responses. If we show our clients that we are disgusted or upset or unable to handle what they're telling us, that might set back the... Um, feelings of safety that that client has within that relationship. So these are just some of the challenges that come with doing this work um, that make it challenging. I want to briefly touch on these three things here. Burnout, secondary traumatic stress and compassion fatigue and talk a little bit about what professionals can do in order to manage these things. Not just what they are, but what we can do to ensure that they do not have a significant impact on us. This is something that a lot of professionals are slowly becoming more aware of in relation to trauma work takes a toll on people. And we are working in healthcare systems and other settings where uh, professionals are experiencing a tremendous amount of pressure and stress. So what is burnout? Well, burnout tends to relate more to a physical, emotional, or mental exhaustion that we feel from doing our work. It usually is caused by a work environment that's under-resourced, maybe having too high a caseload, maybe you're a professional who works only with people who've experienced trauma and you don't get a break from doing that work. It comes from uh, not having sufficient support in the workplace. So, 
It's very common in helping professions. It tends to be caused by stress um, and excessive demands. So maybe feeling like we don't have enough time for our clients, we don't have enough time to write up our notes, we don't have enough time to reflect on our practice, we're rushing from one person to another, um, and what happens as a result of this over time, it's cumulative, um, we can experience burnout. And so this might slow burn away for a while until it comes to a head, and then there's a bit of an explosion where the person feels they can no longer cope with the job. What are the stages and signs of burnout? Well, a lot of people who are in this environment of work um, often feel a lot of pressure to persist and work harder. And that's often the, the message we get from management and from others in our workplace. If you're not coping with the demands of the job, maybe you need to be working smarter, not harder. But what happens is people tend to work harder. They tend to put in more hours. They tend to do more cases and more work because they need to prove themselves as being effective in their practice. This leads to all sorts of problems. Um, you work harder, you feel more tired, you're more exhausted, you're less able to focus, you have less balance in your life, you're not able to manage that stress, then you feel like you're trapped in the job, and then you become more ineffective in your practice. So it's a vicious cycle that goes around. The more you work, the less effective you get in that work. Um, I want to move on and talk about secondary traumatic stress. This is a little bit different to burnout. Burnout tends to come from work conditions and from some of the pressures that we put on ourselves and expectations that we have of our own work. Secondary traumatic stress is a little bit different. Uh, there's lots of um, different labels that this has been given over time. Counter-transference, vicarious traumatization, secondary traumatic stress, co-victimization. Basically, this is what happens to therapists and professionals who start to identify with the trauma that they are hearing and seeing every day in their work. They begin to exhibit the signs and symptoms of that same trauma. They may go home and um, experience flashbacks and have memories and not be able to put their work aside and be worrying about clients there are lots of symptoms in relation to this, but what we see in professionals is symptoms that are very similar to the symptoms that we see in clients who have experienced trauma. I want to briefly just run through some of these and then we'll talk about uh, what we can do in relation to managing these. So here are some signs of secondary traumatic stress. First of all, you've got psychological distress. People can feel emotional, grief, depression, anxiety, dread. They don't want to go to work in the morning. They might have intrusive imagery, be thinking about what clients have described and told them in terms of traumatic events. They might shut down and experience some of that disassociation and numbing and avoidance of, you know, I know I'm not really listening to my clients anymore. Um, they can have somatic issues, sleep disturbances, headaches, gastrointestinal uh, distress, uh, chronic physiological arousal. We can see increases in use of alcohol, coffee, smoking, uh, addictive and compulsive behaviours. These again are all coping strategies for to deal with that secondary trauma, just like they are coping strategies for our clients. Um, and we see impaired functioning, so people start to miss their appointments, keep tra um, find that they're um, uh, forgetting things, um, not taking care of their self-care. If we look at the cognitive shifts that come with this, you see things like heightened sense of vulnerability and helplessness, uh, feelings of not being able to help our clients, loss of personal control, bitterness and cynicism. What's the point? You know, this is just going to go on forever. Nobody ever recovers. Um, and also feeling victimised by the clients that we're trying to help. You know, if I didn't have to go and listen to this crap every day, I wouldn't be feeling the way that I do. Um, so we get into a victim-blaming mentality. If we look at relational disturbances, we see things like a decreased intimacy and trust in our own personal relationships. People start to take this stuff out on the people they care about at home. We see distancing and detachment with our clients, and clients pick up on that very quickly. 
that you're not really present, you're not really attuned, you're not really accepting of them and being with them in that present moment. We're judging them or avoiding them. Um, they can tell that um, we've changed our relationship with them. And we can also see people starting to feel like they are overly responsible for their clients. I can't possibly go on holiday because my clients can't do without me. They will make rationalizations around having to work harder and not take breaks. And in terms of our frame of reference, what do we see in relation to that? We see professionals who start to disconnect from their sense of identity. They change their beliefs about the world. It's a little bit of what I call mean world syndrome. Um, the world is full of pain and suffering and nothing's ever going to change that. We see distortion in values and principles, a lack of faith, a lack of hope in our clients, and a little bit of existential despair and loneliness. I'm the only one who's doing this. Um, this secondary traumatic stress isolates therapists and counsellors from their colleagues. It makes them feel vulnerable. Um, it does a lot of the damage that trauma does in our clients. If you're worried about this, if you're concerned about your own work um, or interested in maybe assessing yourself in relation to burnout and secondary traumatic stress, or maybe looking at your own compassion satisfaction, like your satisfaction in doing the job, SAMHSA has a great three-page tool for therapists and counsellors to assess where they're at on this scale. I've used this in a number of trainings with people and I've found it really helpful to take back to their organisation and say, where are we at on this? And to start to have a discussion about, you know, the importance of self-care in professionals. So let's talk briefly about some of the strategies. What is important? What can help professionals manage this and make sure that they're continuing to provide clients with effective and safe work? The first is peer support. And I think that's really something that we struggle with as professionals is to talk to each other about the troubles that we're having and the problems that we're encountering in our work because nobody wants to be seen as unable to cope or to be unprofessional. Um, if we don't remain objective in our job, how can we be professional? So if we admit that we're having uh, our problems with emotional investment in our clients or uh, managing our, our reactions to our clients' work, people might think that we're unprofessional. But peer support is absolutely critical to helping people uh, work through this. Supervision and consultation is really important. Everybody who does trauma-based work should be able to access effective supervision and regular supervision. Supervision that helps them understand what's going on in their own work and how to work with counter-transference. Training is really important. Uh, going and doing some training around professional self-care, um, that can help people understand the boundaries of their work and why work-life balance is so important. We can seek personal counselling or psychotherapy. And again, explore and deal with how trauma is impacting on us, and even if it is secondary. Maintaining balance in our life. Being able to prioritise self-care and activities outside of work so that we ensure our own safety and our own well-being. We can't promote well-being in others if we don't promote it in ourselves first. And we need to be good role models for our clients. The last one is engaging in spiritual activities that provide meaning and perspective. Often when we feel devoid or, or um, numb or um, that our work is not meaningful anymore, um, it becomes really challenging. So um, being able to relate our work to something more important, a, a, a bigger picture, a, um, a, a, a way of uh, supporting people through a difficult time and um, helping people uh, Providing that sense of care um, can give people a sense of meaning. I want to touch on this because I think this is something that we really need to work on as professionals. When we're working with people who've experienced trauma, one of the things we often need to teach those people is to have self-compassion. They need to be mindful, they need to be kind towards themselves, and they need to stay connected. 
And yet, how often do we stop and do the same thing as professionals? How often do we stop and say, we are doing the best that we can as professionals? How often do we stop and go, be kind to yourself today. You have listened to many stories and many experiences of trauma. Um, take some time out to heal yourself and to look after yourself. And making time to reconnect with what is important in our work. These are things that I think that we need to uh, promote within our own uh, industry. And just like our clients, we can also use the mental health apps that are available to monitor and assess our own mental health and well-being. If you don't want to complete some checklist from SAMHSA, try using one of the apps that's freely available to download on different platforms. I've been using this one because it helps me monitor um, both my thinking and my mood and my sleep, but also helps me set realistic goals in relation to my own uh, habits in terms of work. Um, I also want to touch on compassion satisfaction. I don't want to leave you guys on a really negative and down note. The reason that people do this work is because it is incredibly rewarding. It is challenging, it is difficult, and it comes at a personal cost to us all. But at the same time, it can be incredibly satisfying helping somebody work through trauma and see them come out the other side stronger, uh, more resilient, growing as a person, and taking control of their life. And that's a real privilege and something that we need to remind ourselves of when we are doing this work. These are the things that we know contribute to compassion, satisfaction in people who do this work. When you believe that you are part of a strong community who are all working together to help people, that contributes to your compassion, satisfaction. When you feel that your job is valued by your clients and by the whānau of your clients and family, that contributes to your satisfaction. When you believe that what you do every single day makes a difference, the things that you say, the presence that you have, and the ways that you help your clients take control, these contribute to your self-efficacy and your satisfaction. Working for an organisation that has a clear mission and, and, and goal for working with people who've experienced trauma and working with colleagues, working with others, uh, working as part of an effective team. These are all things that help us feel satisfied in the work that we do. So in conclusion, we have to hold hope for our clients. We have to promote hope in our clients. We have to work with trauma in complex ways. We have to help our clients navigate their way towards recovery and hope. And we have to hold hope when they have no hope for themselves. I want to challenge you to remind yourself that when you see and work with your clients, that you see this as a privilege that every day we get to meet people who are struggling, who are persevering, who are um, showing great strength and courage and love. And that, you know, to see people show that after what has happened to them in their lives is very much a privilege. And if we can in some way um, keep that light keep that flame burning of hope for our clients, then we are doing something to help them move through that trauma, process it, integrate it, recover from it, learn to manage it, and ultimately grow from it. Thank you for watching this webinar. It's been a pleasure talking to you about this topic. Um, keep your eye out on the Skylight Trust Resilience Hub for more resources on trauma and for future webinars. Kia ora koutou.